Hello and good evening to you. Welcome to News 360. And it's live from our news up here at Desawa in Kanda. My name is Alfred Akansi. And I'm Natalie Fort. Let's take a look at the headlines for this evening. 360 Headlines is brought to you by... BNI Investigations begins investigations at La Presby Senior High School following interdiction of headmaster. Government begins valuating property of businessman Alfred Agbeshiwayome as it seeks to retrieve judgment debt wrongfully paid to him. Also, VRA workers' unions to resist sale of thermal plants by government. African Development Bank to assist government with infrastructure development in Greater Accra region. And in business this evening, Vice President Dr. Mahamudu Bamia charges state-owned enterprises to be financially disciplined and viable. We have the details of this and more, including entertainment and sports tonight here on News 360. Feel free to join us with your thoughts as we get interacted on various social media platforms. Our first story this evening, the La Presby Senior High School in Accra is being investigated by the Bureau of National Investigations, BNI, following the interdiction of the headmaster of the school by the Ghana Education Service last week. The headmaster, Samuel Salamat, had appealed to the parents to voluntarily help repair broken down furniture or buy new ones for the awards while they wait for government supplies. So, Natalie, um, as you have it there, we're going to just walk us through exactly what the GES said in announcing the interdiction of some or some of that, Natalie. Absolutely, Alfred. You remember that these 11 names and specifically nine of them being interdicted by the GES. And Samuel Salamat, he, or he is the headmaster of La Presbyterian SHS Greater Accra Region, and he refused to attend the GES investigations into the allegations. The rest of the nine names here wrote, 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 lifted different reasons for which they couldn't. They did charge the parents extra fees, such as not having the adequate equipment at the school. Samuel Salamat specifically said he did not have, or the school did not have adequate chairs and proper learning material for these students. And him refusing to attend the GES and the BNI getting involved makes it particularly concerning, especially raising issues of security in these schools, Alfred. But he is not the only one. There are nine others, but his is the one who will be probing further this evening to get clarity on what exactly his issue is and why he refused to attend the investigations by the Ghana Education Service. Absolutely, Natalie, and that's why uh, questions are being raised specifically as to uh, uh, why the BNI should storm the, off, uh, the, the, the particular premises Certainly of the, of the school, school and restrict media personnel from uh, getting into the school uh, in the area. But still on this uh, La Presby Senior High School, you'll recall that some parents whose words had been posted uh, placed in the school agitated against a demand by the school's headmaster to pay 80 Ghana cities for furniture. This led to serious confrontations that finally led to the interdiction of Samuel Salamat. Most parents whose words were posted to the Presbyterian Senior High School in La thronged the school to demand an explanation as to why they have been told to pay 120 Ghana cities for furniture, brooms, cutlasses and other basic items. <laughs> 
So be able to make CSC in the field. We are not challenging the headmaster. We want the school authorities to fast track the registration process. And twenty, it's in the end of the year. See, mum, no, mum, no, man, no, so process in the back of the time. My mind is so why I know just a SEA boy, Nanny Quinian, and no more no movie in a book. The school authorities have asked us to pay for furniture and other items for our awards. But the headmaster, Samuel Salamat, after a meeting with the parents, explained the school lacks furniture, adding it was an appeal and not a requirement. The final year school completed last year broke many of our chairs and tables. So we are short of chairs and tables. If parents can voluntarily contribute something to us, so I will repair the chairs and tables, it will make it easier for their children to have chairs and tables to sit on when we start class. Here, when somebody is coming to first year, he brings brooms, uh, cutlasses, duster, uh, and some other items. He says the school intends to start serious academic work on Wednesday and needed to make the challenges of the school known to the parents. So we are not forcing anybody. We are only appealing to parents who are willing to help. We are not forcing any parent to pay any amount. We are only telling them that this is our challenge. If I scan through the list, majority of the students who are posted to my school are getting aggregate 30, some are getting aggregate 20. In fact, very few are getting aggregate 14 and below. All right, so this was just a quick recall of uh, what happened last week that led to the interdiction of Samuel Samalat. Now, what has been revealed is that the first year students who were placed in La Presby SHS, who have actually started academic work, have had to stand, some of them sitting on the bare floor, some standing in the classroom, and some classroom don't have the uh, whiteboard or the blackboard to have the teachers actually writing. So they do verbal illustrations of what they are teaching, clearly uh, depicting the fact that the school is in dire need of uh, some resources. I've been joined on Skype by uh, Peter Anti, who is the Acting National Coordinator of the Institute of Education Studies. Uh, he joins us via Skype. Good evening to you, uh, Ms. Anti. Thank you for your time. Now, with your reading of, of the situation at the La Presby SHS and the BNI going there, restricting media from having access there, what do you make of this? Good evening. Uh, thank you very much. I think that we are aware that the ultimate responsibility to pro uh, uh, lies <coughs> with the government to provide teaching learning resources, infrastructure, and other things to the students and um, uh, the other public schools. Again, it is the duty of the government to make sure that to make sure that teaching and learning proceeds as planned. However, the the norm has been that over the years the various teacher, uh, parent teacher associations, and sometimes other people in society donate items, uh, these uh, decks and other things to the various schools. Now, with the introduction of the free SHS, a clear directive was made to the various heads, or I mean the school administrators, that they should make sure that they did not charge any fees from the uh, parents. What I find interesting is that the Minister of Education has indicated the audit of the various um, infrastructure, I mean accommodation, classroom, furniture, and other things in all the schools in the country. So the question, therefore, is if they really did that work, what, what, what steps have they taken to supply some of these schools that actually do not have the kind of things that we are witnessing at the Osu Presby? Or was it that they were just interested in looking at accommodation and left the classroom that the students were going to be placed? I think this is an, an issue that we have to um, minister to come and clarify. If they really did an audit, why is that some of the schools are complaining that they do not have decks, they do not have this, they do not have that, they do not have that? What kind of audit was, was actually <clears throat> undertaken? Again, the, the understanding is that any time that you, you, 
pro the process of teaching and learning. That is where it becomes a problem because the student has not paid his uh, parent PTA dues or whatever it is. That is where it becomes a problem. But where parents decide by themselves that look, this is the situation that our school finds itself in, and we would want to support. I don't okay. think it is a big deal for the Ministry of Education to actually do what they have done to the very particular. Um, headmaster in question. Of course, we have said that we should look at these issues in, in individual basis and address them. And looking at the motive behind what this particular headmaster has done, I think it's 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 unfair on on the part of the Ghana Education Service and the Ministry of Education to to take him through this particular ordeal. Okay, so uh, you make that point, and I'm going to uh, continue from there to the extent that you question the kind of audit that the Ministry of Education did uh, to ensure exactly. that the, 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 the first year students are having the needed uh, materials to be able to learn. Because one of the three arms of this free SHS is quality. Now, how is this situation, at specifically La Presby SHS, affecting the quality delivery of education in the school? You know, the Ghana Education Service, and for that matter, the Ministry of Education, have what they call the quality inputs. And one of them is student-to-dex ratio. And ideally, student-to-dex ratio is supposed to be one is to one. Now, if the, the situation has have been reported is that the students are not even having access to dex, and then it means that that particular variable that adds to the nature of the uh, quality education that we are supposed to witness in our secondary school is 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 is. is, is So uh, that's uh, Peter Ante there. He is uh, with uh, the Institute of Education Studies, indeed, describing the GES's uh, interdiction of some of Latter's unfair because of that appeal that he made on this matter. News 360 Skype interview is brought to you by MTN. Everywhere you go. Now let's turn away from education briefly as senior and junior staff workers union executives of the Tema shipyard have called on government to disregard calls by the maritime dock workers union to terminate the appointment of the managing director of the Tema PSC shipyard. The union executives say the formation of a rival union group has led to the outburst of the MDU and is responsible for, perpetrated, for the perpetrated confusion in the company. Speaking of camera, the union executive said the views of the Maritime Dock Workers Union do not represent that of the workers. A purported confusion at the company has been partly blamed on the General Secretary of the Maritime Dock Workers Union, Owusu Kranting, who is alleged to be agitating for the managing director to be sacked. He is thus accused a few union members to disrupt operations. They intimated that there's no tension within the company and the operations are going on smoothly. He says more vessels have even docked for maintenance works. The union says it will resist any attempt to tarnish the image of the yard. Meanwhile, the general secretary of the MDU is yet to respond to the allegations. So the Ministry of Education says it has secured financial clearance for more French lecturers to be recruited. At the Ghana Institute of Languages, Dr. Matthew Poco Prempe says the quick financial clearance is part of efforts to make French the second official language in Ghana. The sector minister made observation at the swearing-in of the Governing Council of the Ghana Institute of Languages in Accra. He directed the council to expand its facilities to accommodate more students as a result of the free SHS policy. Again, he emphasized on the need to make French a second official language. In line with this, the Ministry of Education has secured financial clearance for more French lecturers to be recruited. The Education Minister also disclosed government is almost concluding negotiations with the Egyptian government to promote the study of Arabic and make it examinable. The agenda of the government is to make French virtually a second language and GIL should position itself to play a leading role in the development of that agenda. 
Later, the governing council of the Ghana Institute of Journalism was also sworn in. The sector minister implored them to provide rigorous training to rid the journalism profession of charlatans. There have been several complaints in the public sphere over the general quality and standards of journalism profession. Of course, not everyone who parades along as a journalist is a product of this institute, and therefore it will not be proper to lay the blame on it. However, it is my expectation that the GIJ will continue to provide rigorous training of its students. And still on education, government is to convert the WA and Borgatanga Polytechnics to technical universities in the next three months. The, conversation, the conversion, according to the Education Minister, Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe, is to strengthen the technical capacity of students churned out to be competitive on the global market. Sector Minister Dr. Matsu Poku Prempe was speaking at the swearing in of the governing councils of the WA and Volgatanga Polytechnics. Eight out of ten polytechnics in the country have already been converted into technical universities. Conversion of the remaining two, the WA and Volgatanga Polytechnics, have delayed because of inadequate retooling. Unhappy with the situation, the two have been agitating for some time now. But the Education Ministry assures the conversion will be done in three months' time. The minister, Dr. Matsu Poku Prempe, charged the new board to collaborate with the National Council for Tertiary Education to conclude the conversion process. That when you have completed your conversion in the three main areas, an assessment is done before Parliament accepts your conversion to a technical university. It's not perfunctory. It's not, it's not just like that. Uh, we want to ensure that when you are converted, you are really a technical university. In a related development, the sector minister also sworn in the governing council of the Council for Tertiary Vocational and Technical Education, COVID. He disclosed that government has secured a $2 million facility to equip all 35 vocational institutions across the country. The cabinet has also approved a loan uh, for all the technical, 15 technical institutes and the 10 technical universities to be fully re-equipped for this project. So government is supporting it both in theory and with the money, with the view that TVET should be the number one area where our kids will find uh, themselves. Our government says it is ready to facilitate any religious body intending to embark on a pilgrimage. Well, this follows the first government-assisted Christian pilgrimage to Israel. Some 50 Christians benefited from the initiative. The 50 Christian pilgrims left Ghana last Saturday to begin a seven-day visit to Israel. Led by the Minister of Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs, they include pastors, musicians, and representatives of some religious bodies. The debate about whether government should sponsor Christian pilgrims has come up again following report that a trip was facilitated by the government. What government has done is to be able to speak to the state of Israel, uh, acquire some, some quota for our people, as well as help in organizing uh, flights for them, as well as uh, hotel accommodation and the rest of it. However, all this come at the cost of the pilgrim. Uh, each pilgrim is supposed to pay about $2,700 for the trip. So government is, is not taking any, any, any part of the cost. No. The minister said this was going to be an annual affair in fulfillment of the president's promise to Christians during the 2016 campaign. Is, is going to continue to do, and that is one of the core roles the Ministry of Chief Tenancy and Religious Affairs is going to play in making sure that these things are done in a well organized manner so that our citizens don't get stranded uh, abroad or in Israel when they go on such pilgrimages. This raises questions of how other religious groups apart from Christianity and Islam would benefit from this initiative. If uh, other religious groupings are willing to go on pilgrimages to other countries and they require government intervention in making sure that 
um, government engages the other governments where they will go on the pilgrimage to make sure that they have safe passage and they are safe there and life will be a bit more easier for them. The government is willing to do that. There have been calls for government to dissociate itself from religious activities, including the annual Hajj pilgrimage for Muslims in the country. The debate will, however, linger now that it has been extended to Christians and all other religious bodies. Well, let's turn to agriculture now. As Member of Parliament for Buza South, Clement Apak has debunked the Greek minister's claims that the four army worm infestation in the country has been contained. Speaking on Midday Live on TV3, he said the pests are still wreaking havoc on farmlands in his constituency. President of the Chamber of Agriculture, Philippa Bajore, also called on stakeholders in the sector to complement government's efforts in fighting the invasion. And you should also complement what government is doing. Whilst the traditional, just about two, three weeks ago, the CSR called farmers across the country to train us, to give us information about a blueprint of, I mean, some traditional emergency preparedness about how we can carve the worms. In the Bonohafu region, farmers continue to count their losses as over 70 percent of cultivated maize and garden X farms have been destroyed by the army worms. Even harvested produce are not spared. About 80 percent of freshly harvested garden X have also been infested. Philippa Champo, an English teacher at Tobodom Senior High and Technical School, who has lost over 50 percent of his produce, says all efforts to control the worms have failed. The Teshima Municipal Crops Officer, Abdullah Salifo, acknowledges government needs to work at completely eradicating the army worms in the region. It is still with us. I wouldn't say that we eradicated, but I would say that we are combating it up to maybe some percentage, a higher percentage. Uh, Non-disclosure of investigations into alleged corrupt practices by security agencies have always raised questions about uh, the authenticity of such investigations and the results as declared. Demands are being made for the Criminal Investigations Department, CID, to make public the investigations on the Deputy Chiefs of Staff to authenticate its findings, even though the two officers have been cleared of any wrongdoing. Here's a report by... Godfrey, tell him. The Criminal Investigation Department, CID, after investigating the alleged corrupt allegations leveled against the two deputy chiefs of staff by musician A, -plus, described them as baseless, unsubstantiated, and without credibility. A, -plus in a social media post, had accused the two, Francis Asensu Boache and Abu Jinapo, of engaging in corrupt practices though he could not substantiate his claims and the CID has also cleared the two of any wrongdoing. The co-chair of Citizens Movement Against Corruption sees the move as a laudable one who should be encouraged. However, he is of the view investigations conducted into such matters should not be kept away from the public. It shouldn't just be that the CID said they investigated and they found nothing. The facts of the investigation should also be made available so that we are all clear that there was an adequate investigation that went in depth. It was thorough and yes there isn't any substance to what a plus said on whether or not the officers would take the matter up to protect their integrity sinanu observes that matters of such nature should not be left to go no matter the actions the victims take in order to prevent others from baselessly accusing other people if some gap has been made in terms of the fact that something was not explored then there is opportunity for a third party to say, oh, but you didn't look at this and so and so forth. Then maybe some other groups can take it up. But f as far as we can see for now, it would appear that CID is saying they didn't find anything. We need to see that report and then we can take the steps for it. On the dynamics of the law when it comes to defamation, where the ones accused decide not to pursue it, a private legal practitioner, Gary Nimakumafo, says the law is clear on the action that should be taken. Everybody must be an owner of his own actions or inactions. Acts that affect people's personal rights, they can decide to push or not to push. If something affects a personal right, you can say that you leave it or you, you for certain reasons, you, you push it.
Some Ghanaians have expressed satisfaction with the investigations on the two deputy chiefs of staff, indicating that it is a step in the right direction. But the question one may ask is, should the officers leave the matter to rest, or shouldn't the law make provision for stiffer punishment against people who are alleged but are unable to substantiate? Godfrey Tanam for TV3 News. Welcome back to News 360. Time now for some business news. And we start off with Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Dubamia, who's charged state-owned enterprises to be financially disciplined and become viable to the economy. Speaking at the 2017 State-Owned Enterprise Policy and Governance Forum in Accra, the Vice President also urged them to improve on their corporate governance structure. The two-day forum is to allow stakeholders in the state-owned enterprises sector to find ways of reforming to enable them to deliver on the objectives for which they were set up. Finance Minister Ken Oforiata reiterated government's commitment to ensuring all stakeholders in the financial sector work towards improving the economy. It is obvious that SOEs still have a significant impact on the economy of our country. The SOE sector therefore deserves all the energy and commitment we can marshal to not only forestall the fiscal risks they sometimes pose to our public finances, but even more importantly, position them to contribute meaningfully to our national development process. Our commitment as a government is to create healthy and functional SOEs that run better organizational, operational, technical, and financial structures. World Bank Country Director Henry Caral admonished state-owned enterprises to have an effective legal and economic framework to guide their activities Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Bamia charged the SOEs to work towards ensuring commercial viability to enhance the growth of the economy. There is increasing pressure for SOEs to justify continued government support and investments, especially for loss-making and inefficiently run entities. It is my hope that you will take advantage of this forum to share with government not your many challenges, but your strategies for ensuring financial discipline, exploring access to new source of capital, transparency and accountability, and improving commercial viability. He again urged them to strengthen their corporate governance structure. Currently, multiple institutions, including the Ministry of Finance, State Enterprises Commission, and sector ministries, perform various oversight functions in the SOE sector. This fragmentation in the government's ownership structure, coupled with absence of, clear, of a clearly defined ownership framework, has limited government's ability to effectively oversee SOEs. <laughs> Now, Tema Customs say they have initiated the process to recover the 65,000 Ghana cities revenue, which could have been lost to the state as a result of under-declaration by the importer. Sector commander of the Tema Collection Point, Felix Mate Kojo, says other three alleged cases of under-declarations are also being investigated. Per the new paperless transaction system, fake documents and the declaration and the value and discrepancies can be exposed during the joint inspection session. As compared to the old system where such discrepancies are undercover with intelligence information. The Monday 18th incident is one of the few which according to customs have been discovered under the new paperless transaction. Assistant Commissioner of the Tema Collection Point, Felix Mantecujo, says the risk control in the new system is robust to check corrupt practices. In customs, those who do the right things have a track record. And in our risk management, they always go through the green or yellow. So you get facilitation when you deserve it. It's only the compliance in importers who have it. You do the right things, you enjoy facilitation. You don't and you, you pay the price. He added that recent figures show revenue has also shot up. In the month of August, the first week experienced a growth by 33% or so. The second week was 35. The third week was 34. 
in the fourth week was about 30 percent but in the first week of september customs in Terma experienced a growth of 56.9 percent so if you compare the first week revenue in september as opposed to the four weeks before september you realize that the increase in revenue for september the first week far outseats what we saw in the four weeks that came before it the importer who is alleged to have under declare has also been invited by the command and punitive measures would be enforced to the latter other discrepancies have also been undercovered pending investigations in the meantime the process is still experiencing teething challenges over 2,000 custom entries have gone through the process so far at the Tema and Takra deports. And let's now turn to the banking sector as the Busong Rural Bank in the Ashanti region has recorded a 23% increase in profit after tax of 1.7 million CDs. This is against the 1.4 million CDs recorded in 2015. Board Chairman Philip Edward Kwabina Entry disclosed this at the 27th Annual General Meeting of the Bank at Kuntunase. The bosses of the Busanchi Rural Bank increased by 26% from 35.7 million in 2015 to 45 million cities in 2016. The bank's loans advances also shot up by 9% from 13.7 million to 14.9 million cities over the period. Board Chairman of the bank, Philip Edward Kobna Entry, attributed the speedy processing and timely disbursement of loans as factors contributing to the performance. He added the bank is leveraging on innovative products and services especially the salad workers bonanza credit product to survive stiff competition from other financial institutions our salary workers bonanza credit product continued to do well again in the year and a review your innovative bank introduced the public sector employee loan finance product that seeks to drop in non-customer public sector salary earners. The board chairman again appealed to the government to reduce the 25% corporate tax rate to enable rural and community banks to continue their contributions to the development of rural communities. The bank extended support to communities, institutions and projects in these catchment areas amounting to a total of 45,000 641 Ghana cities two pesos 2016 as compared to 34,459 Ghana cities spent in 2015. This is our hope to do more to support communities in terms of development. National President of the Association of Rural Banks, Dr. Nana Akuwa also asked government to protect the rural banks from collapse. Ashanti Regional Manager of the ARB APS Bank, George Anno, was impressed about the performance of the bank in the year under review. In pursuance of its corporate social responsibilities, the bank invested over 45,000 cities to support projects in communities and institutions in its catchment area. And that's all the business news we have for you here on News 360 this evening. For more from the world of business, visit our website, 3news.com. Back to you, Alfred. Well, thank you, Natalie. You know, some breaking news just coming through this evening. Uh, a Sprinter bus has just got out of the motorway uh, just a few minutes uh, ago, and two uh, uh, persons are unconscious, and 10 have been also declared, uh, sustained some uh, injury as a result of the incident. So that's what the news just coming through. Uh, a Sprinter bus skated off uh, the motorway. Two persons unconscious and 10 persons have sustained some various degree of injury. So that's what you see on your screens. Uh, this the situation that uh, uh, just about uh, 45 minutes, uh, about an hour ago, uh, the incident just uh, coming through with some eyewitnesses sending us uh, this video, this amateur video, um, I must say also that the we'll speak at the moment, the Ghana National Ambulance Service and also uh, the various Ghana Police Service have attended to the situation 
but has caused some vehicular traffic on the motorway as, as we speak. And that's the situation there, as you're seeing on your screens. I'll certainly bring you more on that subsequently. But away from that, government has begun the valuation of property belonging to businessman Alfred Agbesi Woyome as it seeks to retrieve the judgment debt wrongfully paid him. Some security personnel and officials from the Ghana Valuation Board were sent to his Tresaco residence and three other houses in Accra to value the properties earlier today. Investigations indicate that the valuation of property belonging to businessman Alfred Agbesi Woyome is part of processes to furnish the Supreme Court with concrete evidence in the ongoing oral examination of Woyome over his capability to refund money. The state has been pursuing Woyome since 2012 over the 51.2 million paid him in a default judgment in 2010. He appeared to be orally examined by the Attorney General's office on issues pertaining to whether he owes any debt, whether he has property to satisfy the debt, and the manner in which he used the judgment debt money paid him, among other things. This appearance saw Alfred Woyome revealing he had been out of business since 2012 as he lost all his businesses after his arrest in 2011 and subsequent trial. Woyome was paid 51.2 million cities after claiming he helped Ghana raise funds to construct stadia to host the 2008 African Cup of Nations. However, an Auditor General's report released in 2010 held that the amount was paid illegally to him. Subsequently, the Supreme Court in 2014 ordered Agbesi Woyome to pay back the money after Martin Ami to challenge the legality of the payments. Let's go back to our earlier story that we started tonight with where Samuel Samalato is the interdicted uh, head of the La Presby Senior High School uh, last week, being interdicted for voluntarily asking parents of the first year students to make available some money to fix broken down furniture. Well, we visited the school to assess the situation then. Some of the first year students have been expressing their views about the broken down uh, furniture and the fact that they do not have access to furniture in the classrooms. It will be recorded on September 12th, authorities of the La Presby Senior High complained of lack of infrastructure and logistics. Parents were then asked to voluntarily contribute to repair the broken down tables and chairs of students be made to bring their furniture to school whilst they wait for the ones from government. The headmaster had insisted the decks available would not be enough for all the students. But many parents resist the appeal, even though TV3 News had captured a lot of broken down decks on the compound. On Tuesday, the news team went back to the school to assess how students are coping with the academics in spite of the numerous challenges confronting the school. School authorities remain tight-lipped. However, some students the news team interacted with off-camera admitted there are challenges facing the school. They also affirmed inadequacy of desk compels two students to share a monodesk. School authorities have also been compelled to hold classes in this three uncompleted school edifice. Information available to Media General indicates that the story building accommodating the student is one of many projects that have been stalled for more than three years due to lack of funds. Well, so this is a situation of questioning whether indeed uh, his interdiction is unfair or absolutely. otherwise, especially absolutely. when the situation is telling. And, and, and absolutely, uh, and our team has shown that that's what's happening. Access on the to ground. furniture there. Absolutely. We'll see what happens. We're still live here on News 3 6. You've got the very latest from the world of sports with Thierry Nan in a few moments' time. Stay with us.